Okay. Hi, welcome to my online mentorship group session for May 2017. Uh, today we're going to be talking about painting white objects with uh, colors that are mixed up from complementary color pairs. So the neutral colors that we mix up using a pair of complements. And we're going to paint a white object using the warm and cool neutrals that we get from that complementary color pair. So we're thinking and talking today about the temperature of our light source and how that affects the temperature of our whites. We're gonna be using a warm light source today. And so we're gonna have warm lights on the subject and cool shadows. Um, we're using purple and yellow to paint with today. That's my complementary color pair. And if this looks a little bit confusing, I'll explain it real quick. I've got Hansa yellow. That's a cool yellow, but I'm using it as my warm color in this pair. And then I've mixed a purple, which is right here. And I mixed it from alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue. Now it's kind of a warm purple because I wanted, I was going for uh, the exact complement as close as I could get to this cool yellow. So a warm purple cool yellow is going to give you the most neutral mixture. It's confusing me a little bit though because my cool color, the purple, is feeling kind of warm. It's a red violet, red purple. And my warm color, the yellow, is a cool yellow. So I've given myself kind of a <laughs> A brain twister today. It's okay to do this exercise with two tube colors. I think I mentioned that in the lesson sheet. Um, that would be fine. But we want a complementary color pair. So that's a primary color and a secondary color. You're either going to do yellow purple, blue orange, or red green. And I've shown you examples that I did with blue and orange and also with blue and burnt sienna, which was functioning as the orange in that scenario, and with red and green. All right. So on this color chart, it says orange and blue. I don't know if you can read it, but it doesn't matter. I'm just going to say... And then I've got two spaces in between the neutral and two piles going down. All right. And some of you have done, you know, many color charts with me in the past. It's a, always kind of a good idea. You mix these things up on your palette and that looks, you know, you, you can get a good idea for how that's looking and feeling by just looking at it on your palette. But you, it, it is a different experience to paint it out onto the color chart. Sometimes it shows you problems, issues that you can't see on your palette. Sometimes colors feel like they're different enough on the palette and when you get them up onto the canvas or onto a color chart, it's like, oh, well, that's not as much of an interval as I thought it was. That's not as much of a change from one pile to another. And what we're going for, whether we're working with the full nine, and you're welcome to do that. I did seven, where my first one is pure yellow and my last one is gonna be the pure mixed up purple. I'm only doing seven, you're welcome to do the full nine, but no matter how many of them you do, or even fewer, I think I gave a, an example in the lesson sheet where I only did five piles, you're going for the intervals being the same. So already I'm thinking maybe this is too much of a jump from yellow to the first one. And it felt okay on my palette, you know, it, it did, but then I get it up on the paper and it starts to feel like a pretty big jump. So, that's the kind of thing that this is helpful for. And then it's nice to have this chart and look at your painting and go, wow, I made that painting from these, from that palette. It's just such a lovely illustration of your palette and a really good record for those of us who like to have notes 
And something like this can be done in a sketchbook. If you've got a sketchbook where you, or an art a studio journal where you keep notes about your paintings and your progress, you can sketch out this grid on one of the pages of that and do it. It doesn't have to be done on my worksheet. And you can tape this into your sketchbook. All right, so I've mixed up two rows of tints. You're welcome to do three. Or as many as you want. And the goal is to add white and then add more white. To add white and then add more white. And there's no real, I can't give you a recipe. You know, I can't say take one part paint and two parts white and then one one part paint and three parts white because the diff different paints have different tinting strengths and depending on which color of yellow you choose to use it's going to take more or less white to create that same level of shift in value so what we want to think about is having an equal shift in value with each of these rows with each of these tints not so much adding an equal amount of white that's not necessarily going to do it. It's not the same as cooking where a recipe should function for everyone the same. Our ingredients are going to be a lot different. Hmm. That's funny. How this one ends up looking almost exactly the same as this one. You can fill these color charts out with a palette knife. That is always an option and kind of a fun way to practice your palette knife skills. Wow, that's tripped out. Now this pile looks exactly like this one. I'm gonna be thinking about that for the rest of the day. Why did that happen? Color theory is such a beautiful, such an interesting field of study for me. So did anybody have questions about the lesson? I should have asked. Sarah? Yeah. So when you, you started with the yellow, the hands on one side and the mixed purple on the other, in order to get number five, do you just use equal mixes of the two? No, because the purple is a lot stronger than the yellow. And probably whichever purple and yellow, if you use purple and yellow, Whichever color pair you pick, probably the darker color is going to be stronger, but especially in this case, Hansa Yellow is a color that I have on my palette all the time. It's a really great, cool yellow, but it's super transparent. So it takes a lot more of the Hansa Yellow to create a change in something that you're mixing it into than, say, a stronger yellow like a cadmium yellow would be, which is much more opaque and also a much stronger pigment, stronger tinting strength. So I, if you took 50% by volume, like a teaspoon of the purple and a teaspoon of the Hansa yellow, you would actually probably come out here is my guess with a 50-50 equal measure. So you're gonna be adding, if you, whichever one you choose, add the dark color in kind of slowly. And I did a time-lapse video of me mixing up this palette. I haven't watched it yet. We'll see how it turns out. <laughs> but if it's okay, I'll share it with you guys and you'll kind of get to watch my process for mixing that out. But what I do is I do start with five. I put the yellow out, I mixed up the purple, 
And if you're gonna mix your secondary, if you're gonna mix your purple here, make a lot of it. You don't wanna have to stop and make more of it halfway through. It's really hard to match the exact shade of that secondary to get the exact character of that purple. You remember how I was talking about when I started out mixing it, it was more of a blue violet? Yes. And then I shifted it toward the red. Well, if you need to remix halfway through this process, you may not get back to that exact same temperature right, right. of violet. So, that so you're trying to get to number five. You're, you, you're going to get to the mid-tone as your first um, color that you're doing, correct? Yeah, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. that, that seems to be the easiest for me. And I just judge that with my eyes. You know, it's sort mm -hmm. of, you can always change it. You can always alter it later. So so I really don't, I don't do the tints until I'm satisfied with the pure colors. Right, right. And that, grad that gradation feels right to me. And if you want to check that gradation before, even before you do the tints, you can come and fill out the top row of the color chart and double check it if you're worried about it. But it, it, it's, it's not that important, really. So yes, I mixed up my purple. So I have my yellow and my purple mixed. And then I started with the mid, the, the, the mid tone mixture. So, and then I just did two spaces in between and two spaces in between. And that's the way that I find it to be easiest. Okay. Thanks. To do. Let's see. And that violet is so dark. And you can see when I add the white to it, it's pretty amazing, but uh, when we do, when we mix limited palettes, I talk about this a lot. When you have, when you're trying to mix like three violets, three or two, two violets in between a red and a blue, and they're so dark and you can't tell what the quality of that color is, adding a little bit of white to it really illuminates what's going on in your darkest color, especially on the computer monitor. That looks like black, but add a little white to it. And it's like, nope, that's violet. Okay, so here's my color chart and I'm ready to go. I sent you all a picture of my setup. So I'm painting my white styrofoam, <laughs> my favorite collection of white geometric objects today. Can everybody see? I'm doing this demo on Arches oil paper. And I'm not gonna tone my canvas for this, but I am gonna give it a wash with Gamsol because the Arches oil paper is a wonderful, wonderful surface that I love using, especially for demos, because it's so pourable. You don't have to gesso it. It's got this great texture that's kind of like canvas, but it's paper, so it's pretty absorbent. And the, my paint tends to feel chalky in the first layer unless I kind of wet the surface down with Gamsol just a little bit to stop that absorption and I kind of want to rub it in because I don't want the surface to be so wet that things start to get drippy but I just want to cut down on that chalky feeling. So clear Gamsol and then I'm going to take my number two round brush which I like to use for sketching out my underpainting and I'm going to start I'm going to start in the middle. I'm starting with my mid range, my, this is supposedly my most neutral gray that I'm getting in between purple and yellow. But it's really kind of more of a brown, oh well. And the photo that I sent you all was kind of, kind of serving double duty. It was, I should have sent you one where I was more zoomed out onto the setup. And then I sent you one where I had cropped it in and that was me kind of going, all right, well, this is what my composition is going to feel more like. And I'm not looking at that photo right now, but I can remember sort of what it looked like. And so I remembered that I had the sphere kind of up here near the sweet spot in the upper right. Uh, 
Mm. I have not painted this funny looking little object in quite some time. This strange, whatever it is, pointed thing. I went through a very kind of big phase with these white objects about a year plus. Early 2016, I was doing a lot of paintings with these white objects in them. because I had been, I had started teaching intro to oil painting around that time. And so I started introducing exercises to my students based on these white objects. And then I was enjoying doing the demos so much that I started putting them in my own still lives at home. And that's how it happens, guys. Like. Your art is gonna be about your life, no matter how much you try for it not to be. And you know, not that anybody's necessarily trying not to be, but it's gonna creep in there. What a cool shadow shape that is making. So I hold my paintbrush up to check on my drawing. I'm looking at alignment, right? I'm looking at the bottom of this rectangular thing that the sphere is resting on in relation to the bottom of this. This is a cone, which maybe will become more obvious as I paint it and maybe it won't. It's kind of hidden back there, so it's not really on me so much to do a lot with it, but this is lower than that, only slightly, but it's helpful for me to use that to measure. And it's like, I was finding these white geometric shapes visually interesting and I was thinking about them a lot because I was making this, making these workshops, starting teaching intro to oil painting and thinking about that. I don't know, I'm being, I didn't get a lot of questions about what are these things and why are they in your paintings? People just sort of accepted it, but I'm sure that some people thought it was a little weird. I don't care. And it's like, I, I sold some of them and I, I don't take that as, justification or some kind of like acknowledgement of, oh, it really was okay, but rather I take it as a good sign that even if there's a little bunch of random things in a painting, your viewer is still going to, they bring their own stuff. So in a way it almost doesn't matter what objects you put in your still life painting. Your viewer is bringing so much of their own experience and their own mental stuff to the table when they look at your work anyway, it could almost be of anything if they're really willing if you can visually get them through your compositional tools your color choices and just the beauty of the painting itself if you can get them to actually spend some time engaging with it they're going to bring so much of their own stuff anyway it almost doesn't matter what objects you paint all right so i've got my basic drawing sketched out and now i'm just kind of showing myself where my shadows are. And like I said, I've got a warm light source on this halogen light bulb, my usual. If you wanted a cool light source, use window light or use a compact fluorescent or some kinds of LED bulbs. LED bulbs that I've experienced are much cooler than certainly than halogen bulbs. And um, 
that's fine too. Try it both ways. It's interesting. Or just decide my light source is going to be cool. That's how I'm going to, no matter whether you know, you're using a halogen bulb or not, you can say I'm going to make the light side cool. But it's nice to be able to actually observe and feel that through your eyes. And the more time you spend looking at your still life, the more you're going to start to see these things emerge, especially if you keep thinking to yourself, warm lights, cool shadows, warm lights, cool shadows. Your eyes are going to get acclimated to your still life as you're looking at it, as you're painting it. And it's going to start, you're going to start to see it even if you don't see it at first. So it's almost like take my word for it up front. And then the more you're going to paint your, you're going to convince yourself as you paint your way into it. All right. So we've got warm lights coming from a light source. And what I want to do is I want to find my lightest light and everything in this still life is white. So it's like, well, where's my lightest light? I got a lot of them. Um, but I'm going to find my lightest lights and I'm going to go to my warmest, lightest color and start there. So my warmest, lightest color is yellow plus white plus white. And if I need to conserve room at the top of the value scale, that hierarchy of lights for the highlight, which I do, um, I'm, I know I can just add more white to this in another, in another level and take it up that one more level. So, okay, so my lightest lights are happening on the, this plane of this guy. And kind of seamlessly into this cube here. I'm not, you know, this, these white objects, they're not expensive. If you get the styrofoam ones from the craft store and the floral department, they're for arranging fake flowers. Um, but like this object of mine is a plaster thing that's like a knickknack from the decor section of Hobby Lobby. And these smaller styrofoam ones I bought in a box set from Amazon. They were not very expensive. But these white objects are kind of great to have around. They really give you good practice on lost edges. Because when everything in your still life, you know, lost edges can happen where two areas that are the same value intersect regardless of the color, right? And that's the beauty of them. They're so cool because it's like, well, those two areas aren't even the same color, but they don't need a line in between them because they're the same value. But when things are all the same color, like all these white objects here in this painting, it's really easy to see the lost edges and it's, doesn't feel very risky to put them in. So it's good lost edge making practice. But you definitely don't, if you find yourself at a Michaels, you know, if, you, if these things are a couple bucks, it'd be nice to pick up at least a sphere and a cube or just a, just a sphere. Um, but if you don't have these, you know, a white mug, white bowl, And that will be good practice for, for those things because those kinds of things, those kinds of objects do find their way with frequency into our still lives. All right, so that's lightest light, but I'm going to move down. Um, and I'm going to move because I don't, I don't want everything to be so light. Remember in the lesson sheet, I talked about how I made the darkest dark darker than I was seeing it because I wanted to set that parameter that everything would be a little bit lower key than maybe I was observing it in the world. But I started from that decision and keyed everything else to that. With this one, I started from the lightest light and now I'm going to key everything down from that. Or maybe I'll go from both ends. Let's find the darkest dark and decide what we might want that to be. So we're going to do our cool shadows. And if I squint at this, Actually, my really darkest dark happens on the edge of this thing, but once I'm going to paint out onto my drawing board, which I've been known to do, uh, my darkest dark is the shadow behind the sphere here. So where shall I go? I'm going over into my cools, and I'm going to go here, I think. 
The pure purple is going to be very strong and discordant with the rest of the things in this painting. Now I'm going to use some of that darkest, purest purple, I think, but probably only like with the brightest highlights, I'll use that darkest purple at the very, very end for just a couple of dark accents. So there's my darkest dark. Now that's top row, so it's not a tint. I think having this color chart right here is really helpful for this. It's a lot better than me having to pick up the palette and show it to you over and over again. And the palette does get a little confused. So for this exercise, you want to try to not mix too much in between the piles on your palette. Just find the right thing, zero in on it and go for it. Don't mix in between them especially at first. Later on, that's probably going to happen and it's okay, but it's good practice to just have to choose, have to choose one of the piles. So the next, so I kind of have a choice. This cast shadow is a little lighter than this piece of the cast shadow. And I can either go up a tint from that and keep the whole shadow cool, or I can go warmer and lighter. I mean, cooler and lighter. I mean, warmer and lighter. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to do. <laughs> it says warm. Never underestimate the power of the, uh, the verbal side of your brain. It's uh, not at the forefront when we're painting, but we can influence our subconscious minds by putting up a post-it note on our easel with a little message to ourselves, something like squint or find the lost edges, something like that it could be kind of helpful. So I can either go up a tint from this darkest dark that I was using, or I can go over toward my warm lights and do that. Let's see how that works. So I'm not going into a tint. I'm staying in my top row, but I went up to five to my mid tone. And that's not always going to work. If you're working with, let's say you're working with blue and or maybe like a red and green mix, they're going to be the most similar in value between red and green. So you really are going to have to go back and forth between the top row and the tints much more to get that value shift. Because across the whole top row, if you go red to green, across the whole top row, your values are going to be a lot closer than they are between purple, which is one of the darkest value colors, and yellow, which is one of the lightest value colors. Make sense? So then as I'm going to move into the shadows here on the sphere, comparing, I could probably do this whole painting just in the top row because yellow is so light and it's such a huge value shift. All right, so this is here. Think about putting, think about making the transition from light, and now I'm gonna go to this, my first tint of pure yellow. Think about making the transition between your light and shadows, not so much by putting on a whole bunch of one thing, and then one thing that's really light and one thing that's really dark and then just blending them into each other until they find that seamless transition, but using actual transitional colors and values in between them. So like 
I'm gonna grab from this and paint a transitional color slash value area in between these two. Maybe come to this again. No, this one. And create that value shift with transitional colors rather than blending one area into another. Someone was just making fun of me the other day for using the word slash too much or a lot or at all. I don't know. Is that not a normal thing to say in conversation? Color slash value. It works for me. What can I say? All right, so there's my little sphere. There is some reflected light that's popping that out from the background here. And kind of scratch that in. I was doing a lot of that last night, scratching into my canvas. So the reflected light is in the shadow. So it's light in the shadow and I wanna keep it in the realm of the shadow. So instead of going to one of my warm lights, which are happening on the light side, I'm gonna paint the reflected light, which is in the shadow side, using something that's lighter, but cooler. So what do I have here? This. It's so funny how this feels so much browner, number seven at the top, and then you add some white and it becomes lighter, but it also feels more violety, like it gets cooler. Titanium white really blues things down quite a bit. And if, that, if you start to notice that effect and it bothers you, that's a reason to try a different white. Maybe a zinc white or something. It does, you know, it doesn't bother me that property of titanium white. Cool. Literally, the wall behind that sphere is darker than the sphere. It's not necessarily in shadow. Maybe I will regret that decision, I don't know. You can also use your neutrals. To just kind of be comparing all the time. If I look at the sphere here, and then I look at the background, right there, the sphere is darker. And you don't, try not to repaint it so many times because the more times you touch it, the more things are gonna get blended into each other. If you're gonna go back and touch over it a whole lot, just be very conscious about what pile you're pulling from off your palette because you, if you are hesitant or uncertain about it, these things are gonna get really blended into each other and you're gonna get confused. So everywhere where things are light, I'm gonna put my warm colors. But I'm also looking at value
This plane on the top gets darker as it moves away. Now, I'm gonna maybe transition that. This was probably this, or maybe it was this. And as it shifts over to the side, I'm gonna pull in some of, what is that? Five, the second ten. So it gets a little bit darker and a little bit cooler, but not a lot, just slightly. So let's do some more shadows. Those are so satisfying. Um, this plane of this guy and this cast shadow are dark. They're not quite as dark as this, but you don't have to know that. Or I can maybe go up one level to there. Eh. Mixing in with what's behind it. Challenging. I'm still using my number two round for some reason. Um, I have, I am frequently one to do an entire painting with this brush, especially if it's like an eight by eight, I'll do my entire painting with it. And uh, I can get a variety of marks, especially when it's a little bit beat up like this one is. But I don't necessarily recommend that to you. I think moving to a larger brush, like a four flat or something for this exercise would be good. Um, give you some practice, putting down some really nice, rich, chunky, general brush strokes. Good when we want to loosen up. To use a brush that's a little, feels just a little bit large for the size of the canvas. Especially in the beginning stages like this, you can always downshift to a smaller brush in the later stages of a painting. But at the beginning, this exercise is good for me personally because I'm not such a big one. I just came into a little bit of six. Six is a little bit lighter than seven, but warm, but it's warmer. And warmer colors tend to feel a little bit darker to our eye. So I'm, I don't know, that feels pretty dark too. I'm screwing around in maybe this. These two colors are very close to the same value, but six does feel darker and that's what I had. I had seven plus white going on right here. And then down here, more of it, even more of it, maybe with a little bit of the lighter thing added in. And then if I go back up to the top row into six and warm it up, as I come in here to the corner, it feels a little bit darker. It's a little, it's kind of hard to see on the monitor. I can feel that. What was I saying? Oh yeah. So I tend to make my, I tend to always make my shadows warm. Especially in my flesh tones. I really like 
warm shadows. Personally, unless there's some very strange lighting, I don't see shadows on flesh as being cool most of the time. And then I feel like shadows on flesh also tend to make your subject look kind of corpse-like if they're too cool, there's too much green in there. But even on still life, I generally work the rule of thumb pretty hard that warmer colors just feel darker to our eye. And so I'm making all my shadow colors so much warmer, but it's nice for me to experiment with the shadows being cool. It's kind of good for me. Now this shadow on the cone here, this, this shadow that I just painted, you're, you're right, it's not cool, it's kind of warm. I pulled it from, where did I just get that from? I think that was this. And that's because it's a very subtle light shadow. It's very, very light. It's hardly even a shadow at all. And so, just the same way that I put light that was in the shadow side, I made that light cool. This feels to me like shadow that's in the light side of something. It's like I said in the lesson sheet, I'm putting together a jigsaw puzzle. I am matching, I'm going around right now and I'm just matching value relationships. That's one thing next to another, next to another. And how does it all come together and start working? And when I match these two, I am really happy because it, it matched up with this to this. I matched these and this was still right when I brought it over here. So I was like, yes, success. There's the cash shadow of that. It feels a little darker where it butts up against the background. And then there's like a lost edge right there. Now I think that was this sort of, which is that. Some of this I do intuitively, some of it I don't, but just keep thinking. It's, it's been very helpful since I wrote warm and cool on my chart. <laughs> so think about doing that maybe. And just, you know, if you're painting darks, you're painting shadows that are within a light, like the shadow that was here at the bottom of the cone where everything is light, but this has a little shadow. Think about going for the darks that are warmer. And if you're painting shadow, you're over here, but then if you've got some lighter stuff that's in the shadow, think about staying on the cool side, but going into the lights. You can think about it as two sides of a face, maybe, where like the face has a light side and the shadow side. On the light side of the face, there are darker areas, but they're still not as dark as the darks on the shadow side. All right, where to next? So that is a little cooler. I think that's this. It's shadow in the light once again. So I'm pulling it from my light side, but slightly cooler, slightly darker. And then it's gonna warm up and lighten up as it comes to the foreground. So I'll move over one. No, that's the same. 
to here. That's pretty subtle, folks. There we go. Okay. Mm. The weird thing about this, this thing is because of its surface, it always has reflections down onto the ground. It's hard surface as opposed to the styrofoam, so it shoots. Well, I guess this one's doing it a little bit too. I want to de-emphasize that somewhat. But this geometric thing always reflects light down onto the surface that it's sitting on and then back onto the bottom here. And then there'll be a little line. Let's not get too dark with the line, but we can put it in there. Okay. This is also shadow, light stuff that's a little bit darker. It's not quite as dark as what was, no. It's a little darker than what was going on in the cone. So wherever I pulled that from, I think on the cone, that shadow was that. And so I went to the ground, I started here. I grabbed some of that just to try it. You know, there's not much real right or wrong with this. We're just trying things and learning from it. And you wouldn't, if you were painting an actual white object in the world, in a still life, with a bunch of other colored things, you would probably, you know, if you did it this way, it would end up looking yellow. Everything here is looking very yellow. I'm keeping a lot of saturation in my colors. But if you mixed up some neutral grays using yellow and violet, and you painted that white object, in your normal still life with some of these neutral grays, like maybe with some of the neutral grays that are just happening in here, it would feel white. And it would be picking up colors from the other objects that were around it. But this would be not a bad place, you know, to start making grays to paint a white thing. You wouldn't want, maybe you wouldn't get as extreme as I have by going all the way into my warmest warms. But what if you just hung out right in, in this quadrant here? And painted a white bowl with these. And maybe for some darkest darks you dipped up here. That would be very effective, I think. Can everybody see what I did? And it would feel like a white object, but it would have color. This is just an extreme practice example. I am going to move up to a bigger brush for the background.
No, I'm kind of, I want the background to cool off as I get away from the light source. My light source is warm and it's stronger on this side and as it goes over, it's gonna get cooler and I could do that with everything really. Kind of have. This could cool off a little more. But I'm gonna have that wall back there get cooler as it moves away from the light source. Maybe I'll even go all the way into my purple plus plus. Sarah? Yep. The, the purple in front of the uh, sphere, that touch of purple that you just put to the left of the sphere. Mm hmm Now the light source is coming from the left. And, and okay, and the... And I understand it being cooler behind, but why is it, why is it cooler in front? Is that just for contrast? Well, it's kind of my call. So it's a plane that's catching a lot of light. And it's a sh so it's a shadow on a light plane. So kind of like over here, everything is pretty light, but it's just a little bit darker. It's not an extremely dark, I'm turning away from the light source shadow plane. But it's farther from the light source than the cone is. So even though it's some shadow in a light area like this, it's farther from the light source. And I want everything to feel like it's cooling off as it gets away from the warm light source. OK, I, I see. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm even going to. I'm even going to cool off this plane as it starts to recede, even though I'm going to keep the value the same. So that's like I'm coming here. And maybe added a little extra white to it. Hmm. Temperature shifts are so powerful as far as creating depth, space. They really say a lot. That's this. Maybe I'll blend this shadow out into that just a little bit with this. And maybe I'll come back in and work that shadow some more. I want to work that edge anyway. This is a weird looking painting, but I like it. Right, so, a shadow on the light side. I'm going to make with a warmer thing. But I'm staying down in my neutral lights for the most part back here. That's this, my most neutral, mid-neutral light. You know, it's, it's appropriate. It's the middle of the background. I 
don't want to get too blendy. Hmm. Beautiful. And it felt kind of dark back here behind the cone. Not as dark as this cast shadow. I think that was just an accent that I put there. And it's on the warm side. How does it relate to this? Now I'm painting it with the same thing I painted this with. It's a little darker. That's okay. And I'm coming down to the end so I can slow down a little bit and start letting the painting inform me. Up to this point, I really am focusing on looking at my still life and looking at my palette. But when I get to the home stretch, I have a very subtle shift over toward letting the painting start to make the decisions. Letting the painting be the thing that I'm looking at maybe more than the still life. And I start asking the painting, okay, what's, what's the next step here? Whereas before I was, maybe I was looking to the painting to say, well, where have I not painted yet? Where do I need to paint now? But now I'm kind of looking to the painting for information about what the painting needs and not going to the still life to observe what the painting needs. And just because I feel like I entered that phase for a minute doesn't mean that I'm not looking at the still life anymore or that I can't kind of shift back either. It's all right. I feel to get a little bit more blendy in the background maybe. The negative space is important, but it's not such a star player. And so blending out some of your energetic brushwork is helpful, can be helpful. So at this point, I can kind of come in and say, well, now I can, I've painted the general, now I can paint the specific, or I can start thinking about my highlights and dark accents. Really hitting those little fine details. Or checking in and saying, is there a area that I have not painted? Is there something I forgot? Or just sort of quickly addressed and then moved on from that I want to hit again. I check in with my focal points. Are they detailed enough? Where I had intended lost edges, have I pulled that off? Eh. And now I'm grabbing some of my pure purple. Hmm. Well, you guys see anything that needs my attention before I call this one good? I love it. I love it too. It's fun. Maybe some purest purple right here in that spot again. 
maybe just a little, ugh, this brush is almost dead. It's just frayed at the tip. It's been used, you know, I clean these things, but with use and it's not expensive. Brush, all right, little details. All right, well, I think that's, I think that's pretty good as far as getting the point across. It did come out very yellow. Like I said, this is kind of an extreme example and it's more fun for me this way to kind of push things. You know, I like to push my colors and values and see where that gets me. But if I was gonna be doing a painting, a white painting, a white object in a regularly painted still life, I would use neutrals that were mixed from yellow and purple. I do it all the time. You just, like I said, would want to stay more in the neutral area and even get lighter. Because when the local color of something is white, it, it might be even more white added to this. And I say, if you want to go for three levels of tints, absolutely. I pulled it off with this, but it could go even lighter depending on what you're painting and how light you feel like taking it. Uh, more fun. Okay, any questions? No, I've just really, Sarah, I, I've, I've learned a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. All right, well, good. Then I guess we, uh, I guess we can say goodbye.